Good morning, Sabbath School. Uh, uh, next week we'll be continuing on the uh, discussion of Galileo and what he has to, uh, what that incident has to say for theology in general. Um, uh, this week we are privileged to have uh, Brian Bull and Fritz Guy uh, speaking. Uh, they'll be talking about their book. I'll be talking about their book, and hopefully we'll have some uh, get some dialogue going. Uh, and uh, then you guys can join in in a little while. Uh, uh, to start with, uh, uh, is it Fritz or Brian? Are you going to? Uh, Brian is going to present a short thing on Rakia. Pardon me. Okay. Well, then let me give him a mic so that he can interrupt uh, easily. And uh, uh, then we'll uh, we'll give you the, the time to start with, and then I'll uh, uh, discuss my material. Um, there has been some dialogue already that's gone on behind the scenes. I um, unfortunately I didn't get my material done until late last night, but I sent it to them and. Uh, 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 they showed me what they had before we got started, so it's not quite uh, as if we're uh, trying to surprise each other, although uh, uh, we may still wind up with a few surprises. But part of it is that we're trying to let the ideas um, be there instead of, instead of simply uh, who's the better debater, because I don't think that's a good way of finding truth. And uh, so with that introduction, uh, perhaps uh, I will let uh, Brian Bull start, and if you want to have prayer and uh, begin. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Loving God, as we stop to think about many of the ways in which our lives are blessed, we want to thank you for the blessing of Sabbath time. We want to thank you for the blessing of community and conversation that can enlighten us, can open our minds. We want to thank you for the great Adventist idea of present truth, according to which we recognize that there is always more to learn and that we are on a journey that will last forever. Grant, dear God, that our conversation today may be a useful, though small, part of that journey for each of us. We thank you for the assurance that your spirit is here to guide our minds individually and collectively. Help us to learn with and from each other as we think and talk together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let the light. Uh, the uh, announced topic is the Hebrew word rakia. And we will explore this morning aspects of what it means and why it matters what it means. First, the way these discussions usually begin, with definitions. We picked um, two, two of these uh, uh, dictionaries. The first one is a 15-volume work that is probably the, the source, uh, the unquestioned uh, source uh, for the meaning of Hebrew words and the way in which they're used in Old Testament scriptures. It's called the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, and the author's number in the uh, teens or twenties, and all with excellent pedigrees. There the definition is that rakia denotes a solid, stable entity situated above the earth, which protects the living world from an influx of the waters of chaos. The noun bears the connotation compact, firm, so that translations such as expanse miss the mark. Now, what you've got here 
uh, let's just uh, note that rakia is the Hebrew word underlying the translation firmament or expanse or, 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 and uh, Brian will uh, enumerate several of the, of the existing translations, uh, some of which uh, strike us as almost whimsical, and uh, most of which, however, are very serious. In fact, uh, along the front of the uh, table here, you have uh, a series of uh, translations starting with the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew and the Septuagint in Greek, for those of you that um, are interested, and working through, I think that's the Tanakh, and um, the Message Bible, which is a paraphrase. But uh, it, in order to make clear what the breadth of translation uh, might be, um, we give you next definitions from the theological workbook of the Old Testament. Theological word book, sorry. Now this is an evangelical publication. It um, comes in only two volumes as opposed to the previous one which comes in 15. Not to suggest that the one that comes in 15 volumes is better than the one that comes in two. Just to point out that um, there are different definitions available in the dictionary. This is largely a work of the evangelical community. And here we find that firmament, which is of course, as Fritz has said, the rakia, which the NASB renders more correctly as expanse, literally an expansion of plates, i.e. broad plates beaten out. Now we'll come across this broad plates beaten out again. So I brought you a broad plate beaten out this actually comes from the right section of the world. It was purchased about 90 years ago by my father in uh, the uh, French market in Lebanon. And if you look at it carefully, you can actually see the hammer marks on this. I put a couple of red dots. Now, uh, the broad plates beaten out would not have been beaten out by a ball-peen hammer on, a, on an anvil. They would have been beaten out on a stone with another piece of stone. So I brought you a stone. This is actually a Neolithic stone axe, but it's the sort of thing that presumably would have been used by the ancient artisans to beat out these plates. To continue, this is still the uh, evangelical definition here. In pre-Christian Egypt, confusion was introduced into biblical cosmology when the Septuagint perhaps under the influence of Alexandrian theories of a stone vault of heaven. Remember that at this time, materials were limited pretty much to stone, which was what the common person used, and the newly introduced but still very expensive and uncommon bronze, a mixture of copper and tin. So if, if you're talking to a Sabbath school class at about the time that Genesis would have been written, material things that held back the waters of chaos would have been made either of stone or presumably of metal. Rakia by stereoma. Now stereoma is the Greek word that was used in the Septuagint to uh, translate rakia, suggesting some firm solid structure. This Greek concept was then reflected by the Latin firmamentum, hence the King James firmament. To this day, negative criticism speaks of vault or firmament regarded by the Hebrews as solid and supporting the waters above. Clearly, this book does not support the idea of firmament as solid as did the previous one. So this is just to introduce you to the spectrum uh, with which this word has been translated. So how have translators heard rakia? Well, let's go and look. English translations of rakia. Firmament, Tyndale's version, 1530, King James, 1611, Douay Reims, 1889, the ASV, 1901, and the New King James Version, 1982. Most of the uh, versions that translated as firmament are, in fact, older ones. And you, as you'll see, as we go through these possible translations, we get to newer and newer versions. So that's firmament, English translations of Archaea. The earliest English translation of rakia as expanse that Fritz and I were able to find, and we, we may not be correct here, but we think it's young in 1862. There is an earlier one uh, in Latin uh, called expanse that uh, Paul uh, talked about that when we were last here. Excuse me, uh, Brian. The young here is Robert Young, uh, the 
author of Young's Analytical Concordance, which is still, uh, after 150 years, a major reference tool for all biblical scholars because it not only has all of the words, now he worked off the King James Version, but he organized his entries according to the uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek originals, which makes it particularly handy if you want to find all of the places where uh, rakia is used uh, in uh, the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, you don't need to, sorry about this, you don't need to know uh, much if any Hebrew, just go to Young, look for uh, firmament, and then under firmament, uh, rakia, and you'll get them. And they're there in canonical, that is to say biblical order. So it's a very, very useful tool, uh, although uh, 150 years old now, but uh, still uh, very current. And uh, after Young, uh, Jewish Publication Society, then New American Standard. Now, the New International Version, 1984, uh, translated is at, as expanse, but we'll see it again because the translators of that version have uh, had second thoughts about how it should be translated, and in the newer versions, they translate it as something else. And then the final one, English Standard Version. So, Vault. Uh, Jerusalem Bible translates it as Vault, the New English, the Revised English. Robert Alter, uh, the uh, first uh, five uh, books, the Pentateuch. Today's New International Version and the New International Version. So the 2005, the 2011 NIV and TNIV have gone from Expanse to Vault, which is, I think, the only occasion that we are aware of where a group of translators who previously did translate it as expanse, have now thought better of that, and in their newer versions are translating it as vault. New Life version translates it as open space. Uh, there's five versions that translate it as dome, and as you can see, they're all fairly recent. 1989, 1992, 1995, 1998, and 2011. Uh, we found one, the New Living Translation of 1995, translated simply as space. Uh, message, that's um, the paraphrase by Eugene Peterson. This one here translates it as sky. And then the one that we find most intriguing, the New Century Version, translates it as something. Literally, it, it says something. God created something. So, what does the writer of Genesis identify as the most important entity in the infrastructure of the cosmos? In the first 17 verses of Genesis, the creation story gets to the end of day four, and the sun and the moon are created and set in, in, uh, in space. And what, uh, what are the major nouns? Well, they're off there to the left. There's one that's mentioned 20 times, one that's mentioned 12, and one that's mentioned seven. And your choices are earth, evening, firmament, God, light, morning, seas, and water. Given that this talk this morning is about rakia, um, it would not be too surprising to discover that that is the second most frequently mentioned noun in the first 17 verses of Genesis. After God. After God. God is the first, and that's the second. So if you, if you take as seriously, well, if you take as, as, as useful the frequency with which an author mentions a word as indicating the author's interest in that, the first 17 verses of Genesis are about God and the rakia, God and the firmament. Now, I understand that sometimes an author mentions a word quite often and is not really talking about it, but that's rakia. So God, rakia, and the um, next one is water. I have to apologize for the way I pronounce water. Uh, in America, it's pronounced water. But I grew up in uh, England. In a foreign country. A foreign country. So, for those of you that are interested, I've, I've uh, underlined God here in red and rakia in blue. And God said, let there be a rakia in the midst of the waters. God made the rakia. Waters under the rakia from the waters above. And it was so. Now, I have cheated a little. Uh, verse 8, it says, and God called the rakia heaven. 
So for the next few verses, I count Rakia as one and heaven as another. Um, but even if you don't do that, you still end up with Rakia as the second most frequently mentioned noun. And then at the top, I'm adding them up. In Genesis 1, 9 to 13, God 6, Rakia nothing. Genesis 1, 14 to 15, God 3, Rakia 4. And finally, uh, 16 and 17, God's mentioned three times and Rakia two times. So, what did they picture when they heard the word Rakia? Well, um, in, in the book, God, Sky, and Land, we suggest that we are most comfortable with the Hebrew commentators that say it meant a beaten out metal dome that protected the creation from the waters of chaos. So I've gotten here, a be I've, I've created a beaten out copper dome, um, and uh, it's got some stars on the inside of it. And uh, through the miracle of PowerPoint, I'm going to make the dome rotate. And the stars go down behind the trees. Now, um, I'll have to concede that they probably didn't think of it quite this specifically, because we in the 21st century think of things in scientific terms. We can't do otherwise. We are trained to split things relative to nature into science. And so when we try to recreate something or draw it or describe it, we think in very sharp-edged specifics. They probably didn't think in sharp-edged specifics, but this is the best that we can do for the moment. And now before I quote John Walton, uh, he's the author of this book, God, The Lost World of Genesis 1. Fritz has come up with a um, short uh, biography of John Walton, which I think is of interest. He showed it to me about five minutes ago. So why don't I share that, uh, if it's okay, Brian. Uh, John Walton is interesting to us because his evangelical credentials are impeccable. He was for 20 years a member of the faculty of Moody Bible Institute, uh, which no one regards as a hotbed of liberal theology. Uh, at the present time, he is professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College, uh, also evangelical, uh, though perhaps uh, a little more, if you are comfortable with this kind of metaphor, a little more to the center than Moody, uh, but that's, a, that's certainly a matter of of opinion. Uh, his doctoral education is from uh, the Hebrew Union College and Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati, uh, a very well recognized uh, graduate institution uh, in Hebrew studies. Uh, he's the author of uh, several things, at, at least three books that are relevant here uh, The Lost World of Genesis 1, which uh, Brian will hold up at this queue. Uh, uh, okay, that's it. And, and it's a very useful book. Now, we don't agree with everything in the book. We tend to be a little more dubious about Walton's uh, interpretation of the theology of Genesis 1, um, but his uh, his credentials are pretty impressive when he's talking about the cultural context, the situation in which this revelation from God originally occurred. Uh, he's also written uh, a book entitled "The Ancient Near East," pardon me, "Ancient Near Eastern Thought and the Old Testament." He's written a commentary on the book of Genesis um, and uh, an article in Calvin Theological Journal called Creation in Genesis 1-1 to 2-3. Uh, as I said, uh, we, are, we tend to take him seriously not only because of his uh, scholarly credentials, which are indeed impressive, but also because his evangelical roots and background and context make it highly unlikely that he is theologically prejudiced uh, in favor 
of the uh, kinds of uh, historical context uh, he is convinced uh, provide the setting uh, for uh, the account of creation in Genesis 1. This is the first of the slides, and we'll, there'll be, uh, I think, just three more that address the question in the title slide. What does Rakia mean, and why does it matter? We're quoting John Walton on what he understands Rakia to mean, and then um, Fritz and I will talk a little bit about why it matters. John Walton, day two has been problematic at a number of different levels. For if the Hebrew term is to be taken in its normal contextual sense, it indicates that God made a solid dome to hold up waters above the earth. Then there's ellipses, and I pick him up again a little bit further down the paragraph. Saying that the Bible was wrong was deemed unacceptable, but the idea of rendering the word in a way that could tolerate modern scientific thinking could not be considered preferable in that it manipulated the text to say something that it had never said. We cannot think that we can interpret the word expanse slash firmament as simply the sky or the atmosphere if that is not what the author meant by it when he used it and not what the audience would have understood by the word. We cannot force Genesis to speak to some later science. Then he goes on. We may find escape from the problem, however, but uh, if we go down that pathway, we will never finish today. So let me show you a couple of illustrations, and then I'm through. Um, the, um, uh, Randy Yonkers at the seminary uh, is very interested in this topic. I've heard him talk about it three or four times. Um, he's made a selection from the literature of various conceptions of the Hebrew cosmology. He doesn't think that these are correct. So he, he has selected these to say that they are incorrect. I'm presenting them along with one that uh, I particularly like, just for your edification as to what authors for the last hundred years have interpreted from reading Genesis 1. Here's the uh, rakia. Um, at, that's, that's, there's a dome up here. Here it is again here, rakia or firmament. That's that there and the earth beneath it, and Hades underneath that, and then the waters under the earth um, underneath that. Here's a, a third illustration. My favorite is this one. Here are the waters above the firmament. Here's the firmament. Here's the land. And then here's the waters under the earth, and, um, or under the land in this case. So when we came to... Um, illustrate this in our book, we were faced with the problem that if you draw it as a scientific drawing, you are making Genesis speak to some later science, i.e. ours. So if you draw it as, as uh, clearly outlined and as specific, and you've got labels on this and labels on that. So the solution was, with the help of a gifted artist, to go back to something like a woodcut and just um, kind of illustrate the concept rather than attempting to draw it as a scientific drawing. So, now the land was without form or function. Darkness covered the water. That would be prior to creation. And God said, let there be light. And there's the light um, spilling out over the, the chaos that previously existed. Here's the illustration that begins uh, one of our chapters on the vault. God said, let there be a vault and let it separate the water. And there's the vault appearing in the chaos. And then the final one, God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky. So instead of sticking the sun on the inside of some hemispherical dome, um, the artist just gave us a picture of the sun and the moon and the stars. Now, if you try to <laughs> impose 21st century scientific demands on the ancient text, which we think is is improper, you end up with something like this. And this is obviously ridiculous because it, um, well, I can't even begin to explain how this is impossible on all sorts of levels. But it has that nice crisp outline and you've got the earth there and you've got a flood and anyway, that's, that's what you end up with if you. So I'll close with two quotes from God's Sky and Land, which Paul uh, put his copy up there. What does it mean and why does it matter? Well, there's a section page, I think it's 107. Is the description of creation in Genesis 1 literal or figurative? 
As a case in point, let's recall the first material reality that God brought into existence, the rakia. The early Hebrews pictured the rakia of Genesis as something like a beaten out metal plate, something like this, probably, a beaten out metal plate that separated the waters, protecting the nascent creation of land and sea from the waters of chaos. In the rakia were set the sun and the moon on the fourth day, and it carried the heavenly bodies, that is the rakia, carried the sun and the moon with it as it turned. What was literal for the first listeners is figurative for us. This change from a literal to a figurative understanding of rakia, that is, I don't think any of us believe that there's something like this, carrying the sun and the moon up there, going around once every 24 hours. This change is masked by the fact that we still refer to the sun as rising and setting, that is, moving around the earth. The rakia itself, however, remains a problem that nothing can mask. The waters above it are a problem. Its windows are a problem. The first material thing that God created, the rakia, which the first hearers of Genesis understood literally, they really did understand that above their heads was a dome that protected them from the waters of chaos and that carried the heavenly bodies. The first material thing that God created, the rakia, we today either interpret figuratively or we ignore entirely. Most of us in reading Genesis don't actually see the word. Oh, before Paul uh, gets uh, a turn, let me uh, add this Speak bit. Speak on, because we've got to. We can go, switch some we've, things Okay. We've got to switch uh, some what uh, Brian has described reflects quite accurately the current scholarly consensus I cite three Bible dictionaries, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Dictionary, 1960, which defines rakia as a beaten out plate, the solid vault of heaven or firmament, the usual New Te Old Testament term for the vault of the sky, as it appears from any point on earth. And then it it goes on with more. Uh, the Harper's Bible Dictionary, 1895, says uh, the term rakia suggests a thin sheet of beaten metal. Uh, the ancient Hebrews imagined the world as flat and round, covered by the great solid dome of the firmament, which was held up by mountain pillars. And the Erdman's Bible Dictionary of 2000 uh, defines rakia as a thin sheet similar to a piece of beaten metal that stretched from horizon to horizon to form the vault of the sky. So uh, while, uh, while scholarly consensus is not in itself a determinative or definitive, uh, any uh, departure, any denial of this consensus bears the burden of proof. Uh, one can't just say, well, that's a bunch of liberals, and we don't need to bother about what they say. Uh, even though in the past, though not more recently, uh, some evangelical scholars have, have taken that route. It's yours, Paul. Uh, thank you. I've, I've got a mic. Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much for that introduction that uh, I think gives a, a partial answer to some of the questions that I was going to raise and basically I was going to try to leave them at the end so that uh, they could be answered and some of them have already been answered so uh, we'll be able to skip through parts of this a little faster. Um, the book of course we talked about it's uh, um, when I initially introduced it, I said it's an attempt to bring us back to the original meaning of Genesis and then draw conclusions, and I applaud the effort. I said the most important creation is a hard metal dome over the earth to keep the waters of chaos out. Um, uh, I am gathering that at least you would agree that it is a very important part. And it is a major reason why the book was written, to bring this to our attention. I, I think that's a fair statement to make. Um, uh, at the time, you uh, disagreed, but uh, I didn't hear an outline as to what was the most important part if the rakia doesn't fit there and, and uh, where the rakia fits. Certainly, in the, it sounds like at the beginning of the, of the story, you would certainly rank the rakia as number one. 
Is the, I think it would be fair to say that it was um, a very important part of the infrastructure of the cosmos. There are other things that, um, that we probably would uh, say are equally important or maybe even more so, but in the first 17 verses of Genesis, it's God and the Rekia, yes. Yes, okay. So um, I'm going to skip over this. This is just an illustration of where it fits in the book. I don't think I have to prove the point since it's been uh, conceded. Um, more quotations to the same effect. Um, and uh, then simply I raised the question at the end if this is, uh, why not just say the Rikia, at least for the, first, uh, for the first part of Genesis 1, is the single most important thing, other than, of course, the actor God himself. Okay. Now, there was a couple of things that uh, I took issue with before. One of them, I think, was resolved, um, and that was the translating of wolf as birds, which was really culturally insensitive. And one of the arguments that was made is dependent upon that cultural insensitivity. That is to say, it made perfectly good sense for the author of Je Leviticus to list bats among the unclean birds that were not to be eaten, but we know bats are mammals. They didn't care about mammals. They cared about winged creatures, and so that criticism of the biblical record probably should be retracted. I think that's fair to say. Not really. This is not a criticism of the biblical record, but an acknowledgement of the character of the biblical record. Right. We're not, we're, because but, it's but part But it is a criticism to say, to say that unclean birds were not to be eaten. It was unclean winged creatures and it does, in fact, fit, even though we might classify things differently, that may be a criticism of our cultural insensitivity. Uh, yes, and that's, that's the point, that we cannot read the, the Bible as if it were a 21st century, scientifically informed textbook. I agree with that. It, it is not, and that was, that's the only point we're making. Yeah. We're not complaining. We're right. just, just well, saying... You know, we, we must read the Bible as it was written uh, and not uh, revise the text uh, yes. to suit our scientific But more importantly, as we understand that, from their point of view, they were, in fact, correct. Oh, yes. Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, Haita, yehi, is not a past tense. Yehi is the future tense. The way... You, the way the Bible gets, uh, does that is by putting wayahi, which is an entirely different word. It changes the tense back to the past. And uh, I think that uh, it's probably fair to say that you would concede that point. The uh, complete or finished yakal, uh, wayakalu, wayakal, the Hebrew verbs and sentences are not, in fact, identical. One's passive, one's active, for example. Um, one is a plural subject, one has a singular. Um, and then finally, the translation of Rekia as expanse, going back to the Young's Literal Testament and reappearing in the ASB, NIV, ESV, and NAT, has no linguistic justification. Eh? Uh, of course, in the book, you conceded that maybe there is a little linguistic justification in the passage itself. But I'm going to make the case that, in fact, there's considerable linguistic justification for translating it as expanse. Um, and I will just skip over this part um, because um, we can come back to it later if necessary. Um, there is an inconsistency in the presentation as I see it. The Rakia is urged as central, at least for the first part. The Rikia, we have to hear a solid bowl, even if it clashes with our ideas, even if we can't fit it into our ideas. We have to hear that because that's what they meant. But we fudge on the days. Why not simply admit that the days are also intended to be literal by the original writer, by the original hearers or readers, and that uh, uh, you know, if we don't like that translation 
If we don't like that understanding, we just say they're wrong. Um, why not come out clearly and say the writer intended them to be evening, morning, 24 hour more or less days? Well, uh, in any case, the burden of proof is on the person who makes the claim as to whether they are literal or not. Um, we, what, Brian, kind of fudge on that? Uh, we don't, the, the question is really, what is Genesis 1 about? Is it about the world or is it about God? We think the evidence from the text makes it absolutely clear that Genesis 1 is a theological claim about the nature of reality in general, that is, that everything that is is a result of the loving, generous, creative activity of God. And that uh, that is what the author is concerned about, and that's the message that we ought to take. Now, How, can, I, can I parse that just a little bit? Uh, after I say one more sentence. Okay. Uh, when and how the earth came to be what it is, is at most an interesting scientific question. The fact that we are here because of God's loving activity is far more important than any scientific fact because that gives uh, character, meaning, focus, to our whole existence. And uh, it's our premise and, and the motivation for the book was to call attention uh, to what seems to us a fact that the author of Genesis wasn't interested in the kinds of questions that Western culture has had at the top of its agenda for the last uh, three or 400 years and that we need, therefore, to take ourselves back to their concerns, their mindset, and listen to the message as, as best we can. And this takes some doing. Uh, as best we can to what they heard uh, from this wonderful bit of divine revelation, namely that God, one God, not a whole bunch of them, but one God is the source of everything that is. I would agree with that part of it, but I don't see the ancient Hebrews listening in and thinking, well, these must be some kind of metaphorical days. The, the image that immediately is conjured up is day, and it takes some kind of mental effort to try to resist that. And I'm asking, why do we have to make that kind of mental effort? Why would the ancient Hebrews have tried to make that kind of effort when it didn't conflict with anything they knew about? Well, <coughs> let me interject here. Uh, we do translate days as days. Yom is translated as day throughout the book. The um, day in English, however, uh, means a lot of things besides a 24-hour period, as you, I'm sure you wouldn't have any problem with agreeing with that. And yes. in Hebrew, it has, the same, it has the same breadth of meaning. It can mean uh, several things besides a 24-hour period. And we do make the case that in, in uh, Genesis, we can find no 24-hour periods. We can find a fairly, fairly large number of 12-hour periods referred to as day, you recall that the light he called day and the darkness he called night, that would be a 12-hour day. Um, yes, but I also recall that the evening and the morning were the first day, or more precisely, day one. Well, and the evening and morning were a second day, and the evening and morning were a third day. And that kind of thing, it seems to me, just projects out to these people that they're talking about days that have evenings and mornings. And that the evening, and uh, there may be theological significance behind that, but the immediate 
hearer would hear day. It's as if I was talking to you and telling you about, I was at a convention once. And on the first day we talked about this, and on the second day we talked about that, and on the third day we talked about this, and on the fourth day we had several side meetings. And you would immediately assume, even though English has broad meanings for day, that day, in fact, meant precisely a 24-hour period, or at least the daytime part of that period. Uh, in fact, if I said day and I was talking about meetings at 8 o'clock at night well after the sundown, you'd probably assume that that was still that same uh, English day, which starts at midnight and ends at midnight. We have an in entire chapter on on the uh, creation days, and I'm afraid if we go down that pathway rather than talk about rakia, we, we probably won't should get anywhere. Yeah, we should uh, we should but allocate an entire. Then maybe hour. we will leave it at that for now, and we can come back to it later if Fair we enough. need to. Um, and then the translation of rakia's expanse, again. Uh, it goes back be it well beyond a Young's li literal testament if you include Latin. Uh, Leon uh, 1527, Santis Pagnini, uh, and I do believe that is Latin, not Italian, but uh, they use expansion them, which doesn't need a lot of translation. Uh, and this is before Copernicus, so this is not trying to adjust to a new cosmology leaving uh, behind the idea that Copernicus may well have thought of the stars being in some kind of a, a, a sphere anyway. Um, if you suppose that there's a bowl, then either the stars move in the bowl or the bowl moves with the stars attached. And my understanding is that your picture is that the stars, in fact, do move with the bowl. Is that correct? In which case, the bowl, because it goes around is actually a sphere, or at least maybe there's a hole in the south, but that's uh, the only part of the bowl that isn't uh, there. Um, is it fair to uh, say that the bowl is a sphere? Well, again, I inverted hemisphere. Uh, the the Hebrew isn't particularly clear on this. It's it's okay. clear that the that they they viewed the upper part as a sphere. The lower part. Um, there are some of the texts that suggest that they thought of it as a sphere and some that they thought of it uh, otherwise. So, but I... Uh, it would be interesting to see those texts and uh, look at them carefully. We'll come back to that. Um, for some reason this thing is complaining. Um, clouds cause rain. There are several uh, texts that can be found that talks about clouds and winds without rain, which implies that normally they have rain. Um, I covered the heaven with clouds, prepared rain for the earth. Uh, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves. So obviously uh, rain came in the Hebrew conception primarily from clouds, if not uh, totally. And um, at least I can't find a text other than the windows of heaven, which is ambiguous, and we'll get to that. Uh, about where rain came without clouds. In fact, this is uh, particularly interesting, the last text, which says, ask you of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, and guess what? He's not just going to send rain, he's going to send clouds first, and then give them showers of rain. It, I, I was fascinated by this one, because I didn't realize until I read the story of the flood very carefully that both torrential rain, which comes through the sluices of the firmament, and regular rain, is talked about on several of the verses. And particularly when it says the, the windows of heaven were stopped up and the rain ceased. Yes. It's talking, I think, they clearly understood that rain came from clouds. They didn't understand where enormous torrential rain came from. And that was, the, so mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the flood story, I think you'll find that there are, in fact, two, two sources of rain, one for torrential rain and one for the normal sorts of rain. Yeah. And they're both mentioned as stopping and starting. And uh, in the case of the, uh, we're going to go to the windows of heaven next, which is the windows of heaven were opened in the uh, Genesis 7:11, And this is uh, comprehensive as far as I know. You can find the windows of heaven again in Genesis 8:2, where they're stopped. 
Um, well, there you got the text that I was referring to. The fountains, the windows of heaven were stopped, and, and the, the rain from heaven indeed. was... Yeah. No, the, the, you've and got two kinds of rain there, I think. You might. Uh, on the other hand, that may simply be uh, uh, repeating the same thing. Yeah, so it's, it's hard to say from that text alone exactly what it means. Um, but this is interesting. There are in Second uh, Kings 7, 2, and 19, there's the, the expression... Windows in heaven, where God opens those windows and suddenly there's grain. And here's another one which is uh, uh, familiar to most of us, which is Malachi 3.10. Uh, I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. What that means is that when the windows of heaven open, whatever God wants to come down, comes down. And it's not necessarily waters of chaos. It's if God wants rain to come down, then the rain comes down. If God wants something else to come down, then something else comes down. And you, I don't know that you can say that the windows of heaven, uh, if they open up, automatically put rain down. Just because something is referred to metaphorically, I don't think means that it didn't actually have an original meaning, which is later times came to be used metaphorically. If to have a metaphor and have it useful, it's, it's commonly the case that you have something originally. It could have been metaphorically to begin with. Yep, sure could have. Um, God stretches out the heavens like a tent. There are all kinds of texts like that. Um, and just this is, and is particularly interesting because it's Psalms 104, which of course is a kind of quasi-creation hymn. And it's interesting, you cover yourself with light as with a garment, so we start out with light, that's day one. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, that looks like day two. But it's stretched out, and it's like a curtain, which does not bring to mind this hard dome. Um, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out to, to dwell that stretch them out. These two texts we'll come back to again because they're even more fascinating. Um, they created the heavens and stretched them out. Stretched forth the heavens alone. Um, I have made the earth. I have stretched out the heavens. Um, Forget us the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens. So we have all kinds of expressions that seem to indicate that in fact there is something stretched out and it's the heavens it's the same word that is used in Genesis 1 Shemayim um, here's again stretched out the heavens stretched forth the heavens it's the same word that's that um, that's used for Moses stretching out his hand mm -hmm. um, what Paul do you take to be the 21st century significance of this language stretched out the heavens. In what's, what sense are we to, to make of that? Right now, I don't want to even go there. I want to stay with the significance to the early Hebrews because that's what we're discussing right now. And then we'll try to see what we can do to fit all this stuff into some kind of a model perhaps later. But right now, I want to stay with the Hebrews. I don't want to pull us back into the 21st century and, okay. and bring our models into this. In Zechariah, you're a long way from the early Hebrews. Well, yeah, but you're as close to the early Hebrews as we can get. You don't think they learned something about astronomy in a thousand years? Um, well, I'm glad to hear that it's a thousand years, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when Zachariah was. <laughs> but, uh, but beyond that, uh, I think that Zechariah lived much closer to that worldview than we do. And I think that we, and besides that, it fits in with the rest of it. Look at it. Well, Even if you take Zechariah out, the rest of them still have stretching out the heavens. Uh, if we're going to go back to later 
uh, witnesses, we probably then have to go to 250 BC, which was after Zechariah, when the Septuagint was translated, because there it's quite clear that it's a solid dome. We'll come to that in a minute, although you already covered it uh, in your introduction. Um, now, it's important to realize that the, it, when we discuss the rakia itself, that the root raka is not determinative for the meaning. And there's a reason for this. Words drift. To illustrate it in English, a bug was originally a small crawling creature. You can talk about sow bugs. You can talk about ladybugs. Um, as time has gone on, it has been constricted in biology to an insect, which rules out sow bugs, with, small, with crossed membranous wings and piercing, sucking mouth parts, like assassin bugs. And that ladybugs are not actually ladybugs, they're ladybird beetles. Now, uh, in the meantime, it spread out into another area where it became a verb, it's something bugs you. And that's like, you know, it's crawling around and it's irritating, okay, like a bug would do. And it wouldn't matter what particular kind of bug, whether it was a biological bug or whether it was a generic bug. Then it came to get stretched further as an error in a program. Um, the first discovered error in a program actually had a moth that had gotten fried between two vacuum tubes back when computers were vacuum tubes. And they couldn't find out what was wrong with the program and finally they found it and they used the word bug in its original broad meaning which covers moths. And so they pulled the, bu the bug out and the program worked. And ever since then, it's been called debugging programs. And in fact, Bugging ha has grown from programs to any kind of uh, mechanical device that we make. Automobiles, for example, uh, will have a bug in it somewhere. And it comes through the computer. And finally, because of that, it has come to mean an undesirable feature of something that somebody has produced. And that undesirable feature uh, will often be countered with uh, well, that's actually a desirable feature. For example, you have to double click in order to get out of something. Well, that means that it gives you an extra chance in case you made a mistake to correct yourself. And they will say, that's not a bug, that's a feature. Which, in English, uh, the, um, uh, those two uh, definitions can be put in jarring juxtaposition by uh, the uh, story about the waiter, uh, waiter, come over here, there's a bug in my soup. The waiter comes over and looks and says, that's not a bug, that's a feature. And the point of it is that there are two totally separate meanings of the word bug. Now the same thing is true in Hebrew in other instances. And uh, again, I'm losing this. Um, Bayom. In the day, literally, b, in, yom, day. And these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they are created in the day. Wait a minute, weren't there six days? Um, but the tree of knowledge and of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest of it. Did Adam and Eve die that day? Um, for it shall be on the day that thou goest out and passest over the brook Kidron, thou shalt know for certain that thou shalt surely die. Um, which the Lord God commanded of the children of Israel in the day that he anointed them. This is Aaron and his sons to be priests. Wasn't there an eight day ceremony? Well, you're going to say, well, maybe there's just some mistake here. Maybe there's, well, here's the one that kills everybody. And the commentators all give up at this point. Leviticus 14.57, this is the end of this story of leprosy, and it says, to teach when it is unclean and when it is clean. That when is actually literally in the day. 
And nobody translates that that I know of in the day it's unclean, because it obviously doesn't mean that. What has happened is that that little prepositional phrase has shifted so far over that it's no longer recognizable as in the day. And that raises the question, maybe it should have been translated in Leviticus 7, when? And we have no reason to, if there was an eight day ceremony, it's talking about the whole ceremony, not just one specific day. And maybe when uh, Solomon talks about in the day, he's not thinking that, you know, in the day so much as he's thinking about, now listen, when you cross over, you know you're going to die. And maybe back here in Genesis 2, 4 and Genesis 2, 17, it should be translated when. When the Lord made the earth and the heavens. And to... Two, two more, uh, in the day that thou eatest of it, that should be when you eat it, you will die. And it's not really being that specific about the precise day that will happen. And the point of it is that even though root meanings are important, and I will concede that, that usage is more important if you really want to determine what a word is. Yes. So other people have looked at this and said, oh, yeah. I'm curious as to whether they do the same thing in Genesis 127. One uh, 227, I'm sorry. Now, with that, with that beginning, uh, or that introduction, I want to look at the text on Rekia. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. All we know is there's water on top and water below. We don't know exactly anything more from that text. NIV has in the day for 2.17. Interesting. Yes. They missed that. Um, and uh, here is God made the firmament and divided the water. So that's just restating what we had in the next uh, verse. And God called the firmament heaven. So now we have a definition for the firmament. Um, and I'm used, deliberately using the firmament just as a kind of a fill-in word, even though it does imply firm. Um, this is, of course, the King James. Um, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, so uh, something can have lights there. And God made the lights, and God set them in the firmament. Um, whatever the firmament is, it can take lights, and it can separate waters. That's what we can determine from the context itself. Well, the final one, of course, is Genesis 1.20, where it says, the fowl may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. I think it's literally in the face of the firmament, but uh, basically... Uh, it's panning its face. If, if you want to, you, I guess you could say that the firmament is there and the fowls are flying just below it. Uh, the fowls fly below the clouds, and we know the clouds have water. So that, that is something that you have to take into account as at least a possibility. Now, I'm not saying that from these texts you can prove that. I am just saying that from these texts you really can't prove much of anything. You really have to go elsewhere in order to get the firmament to be firm. Well, what else do we have? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Well, that just identifies heaven with firmament, and maybe not even there, because you could always have synthetic. Uh, although I think, given our other verses, it's easiest to say that that's par pure parallelism. Uh, praise you the Lord, praise him in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament. Is that synthetic, or is that um, uh, a definitive definition of firmament? Uh, I'm not sure that I could push that too hard. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. That's Daniel, of course. And it's the brightness of the firmament. Uh, and the firmament apparently has a relationship of some kind to stars. Well, given that uh, the sun and the moon were put in the firmament, that wouldn't be too surprising. 
Whatever it is, it has to do with that. That's about all that you can say from the text themselves. You're going to Ezekiel, aren't you? Uh, not, uh, oh yeah, I'm going to Ezekiel now. Let's go to Ezekiel. And here's an interesting little passage. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was as the color of the terrible crystal. Um, boy, that takes some explaining. Color is iron or eye. Um, which is sometimes known as well, but I don't think well, uh, a well of water really fits in this particular area. T terrible is just simply, uh, yare, it's, um, it's to be afraid. So yeah, that one would fit. Crystal is usually translated ice or snow. Most places translated it crystal here with the thought that it's clear. So it's clear colored whatever it is. And under the firmament, their wings are straight. And that doesn't, again, that doesn't tell you much. It just says under the firmament. And uh, the, the firmament was above their wings. That, um, then we come back to Ezekiel 1, a little further down. Actually, this is just continuing the passage. 24 doesn't mention the firmament. 25 does. There was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads whenever they stood and let down their wings. So there's something above the firmament and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. So there's a, above the firmament, there's this stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of appearance of a man. And of course, the immediate impact to the Israelites of that time was that this particular firmament on top of it sat the throne of God. Um, and then uh, Ezekiel 10.1, again, um, basically says the same thing as our last verse did, which was, there appeared to them as it were a sapphire stone, as the appearance of a likeness of a throne above that firmament. Now, whatever that firmament was, it was clear. Um, and I link this with Exodus 24.10 because many people have done that before, and I think it's reasonable. Um, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. Now, unfortunately, that's not a very good translation from the King James. If you get down to the Hebrew, it's Wayiru et Elohe Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. That's pretty straightforward with the hat regalau under his feet, kema'asa uh, libnat, like a making. Well, like a work that would pass, but libnat, libnat is clear, like a working of clear sapphire. I have no clue as to where they got paved out of that. Um, maybe somebody can find that out someday. Ube etzem hashemayim la toher. And this is ube etzem. Etzem is bones. What are bones doing in here? Bones of heaven? Um, maybe it has something to do with firmness or structure. Um, and this is in its purity, if you want to get down to close to the root. So it looks like if you're going to make the firmament of anything, it's got to be of crystal. Judging from those uh, passages. It's got to be clear, whatever it is. Um, but what about rakag? Well, rakag does mean to beat. They beat the gold into thin plates. They were made broad plates. Notice that the, it's the, the importance is spreading it out. Because you can beat stuff without spreading it out. You can beat it to powder. And in fact, if um, this thing will wake up here a minute, we're going to see uh, there are words that can be used for beating them as small as dust. 
stamped them as the Mario of the Streets, and interestingly did spread them abroad. Now you'll get two different translations out of this, depending on whether they want to go with the root word or whether they want to go with the sense of the passage. Interestingly, this word is omitted from the parallel in Psalm, I think it's 18. It's gone. This is uh, a psalm that got into one of the other books, um, but it's not quite identical to the psalm in the, in the other book. And spread them abroad is one of the translations. Um, uh, Job 37, 18, this is, I'm actually just going chronologically. I haven't organized this in, in terms of uh, spread out the sky. Now spread out is clearly not beaten out because the sky is actually the clouds. This is a mistranslation. Go look it up. It's fascinating. Um, Could you go, go back to that one and, and comment on the molten looking glass as to what that might be? I will. The, the, uh, which is, is supplied, just for what it's worth. Strong is hezek. Um, it's the word that's in Hezekiah. It's uh, God is strong. Um, a molten looking glass is the word that's used for casting stuff. And that has interesting implications of its own, is that the spreading out apparently doesn't have to be beaten out. That the spreading out has gotten beyond the beating into spreading. I, I thought it was um, most often used for a mirror. Wasn't that the way they made mirrors in those days? Um, it's used for all kinds of things. Casting of, of sockets for the, t uh, the tabernacle, for example. Yeah, but I mean, uh, a molten looking glass would be a, a flat. Yeah, it would be a flat thing, and it'd probably it. pour it in, let it set, and then polish it off afterwards, is what my. Uh, uh, and here's another one to him that stretched out the earth above the waters. You don't have the picture of beating here, it has gotten beyond that. It is now simply stretched out. Um, the workman spreadeth it over with gold. That's probably done by beating. Um, he spread forth the earth, Isaiah 42, 5, and we're going to come back. To, uh, uh, if in fact, this is interesting because here is clearly Hebrew poetry, and we have, he created the heavens and stretched them out parallel. He st spread forth the earth parallel to stretching out the heavens. So the picture of the tent, the picture of the spreading, and the beating has basically disappeared at this point. Here's another one, the same set of texts. Again, we saw that. Um, he that uh, stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spread abroad the earth by myself. Um, silver spread into plates. Now here's two last ones that are, in fact, beating. Stamp with thy foot. That's uh, apparently the root of the word to begin with, stamped with the feet. So that led Ganesius, who's older than most of our, uh, uh, the, uh, but a very respected uh, commentator, to say, to beat, to strike with the feet as an indignation, no, to, to spread out by beating, and simply to spread out. To spread out, to overlay. So if rakia comes from rakag, there is at least one meaning of rakag that could be translated expanse. Now, where does the idea of a earth with a flat bowl come, uh, uh, flat earth with a bowl come from? Well, it actually comes from Lactantius. Lactantius, in fact, it went through Cosmos into Coplustus, and then, um, in fact, none of the none of Lactantius' comp uh, contemporaries believed what he believed with the exception of Cosmos. Um, the flat earth, in fact, was ridiculed, and, uh, and uh, Copernicus used it as a slam dunk, for it is unknown that Lactantius, otherwise an illustrious writer, but hardly an astronomer, spoke quite childishly about the earth's shape when he mocked those who declared that the earth has the form of a globe, which means he was mocking all of his contemporaries. But see, Lactantius thought that everything that the... Uh, uh, Greek philosophers believed was bunk, 
And so if they believe the earth was round, well, that must be bunk too. Copernicus picked it up, then William Whewell, it went through Washington Irving, it went through Antoine Jean Latron, it went to John Draper and Andrew Dixon White, and once it got into there, it went into the standard, um, uh, the, the standard uh, belief in academia. And it got backdated to the Babylonians. As W.G. Lambert noted, that there is no evidence. The idea of a vault in heaven for the Babylonians is not based on any piece of evidence. P. Jensen simply translated the Babylonian word for heaven in Enuma Elish uh, by vault of heaven and thereafter assumes the point is proved. Uh, if we say that, the, the question, and, and I'm not, you know, not going to say that you have to have the answer now or else you're wrong, because that's not the way this thing works. Um, and I'm not going to say, well, we need to talk about that, and we need to, uh, is wrong either. But I, I would ask the question, is there any evidence other than the apparently discredited translation of Jensen that supports the Babylonians' belief in a dome? If not, can we really say that the Hebrews borrowed their idea from the Babylonians when the Babylonians didn't have the idea to begin with? I don't think there's much evidence that uh, the Hebrews, we know they were influenced by the Babylonians and the Egyptians, but they were pretty novel. I don't think they borrowed. Um, they, 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 it's clear that the Hebrews believed in a dome. Whether they got it from the Babylonians or not, I think is highly questionable. And, uh, John Walton chided us for not going back into that in great detail because that's his area of expertise. Um, it's not ours. So. Now, um, some of them we've already covered, and I think that, uh, in fact, most of them we have. Um, it, it seems to me that you have to have the bowl as being almost a sphere with perhaps an opening at the south um, because we can, uh, y if you were in Israel, you could look out and see a hemisphere, but you also notice that the hemisphere rotates. And that means that all the way around the hemisphere, there've got, there've got to be stars stuck in the same place. And that leaves you with almost forced to believe in a sphere rather than a hemisphere. Um, and uh, I, I left it uh, the days of Genesis 1 intended by the writers and heard by the readers as literally uh, days of roughly 24 hours. Um, I'll give you guys a chance to respond, and then we'll, uh, for those who can stay, because I think we've uh, rather overstayed our uh, time period, <laughs> uh, we'll allow questions as well. Well, um, I think we have actually touched on most of these, and I appreciate the uh, very um, Thank you. careful work that you did in going through um, all of the texts. Uh, I was fascinated, as I'm sure you were, by the difference in the way in which the same word, archaea, is translated in Ezekiel than the way it's translated in Genesis. Where there is a difference, the, uh, the translators in Ezekiel always veer towards something that's more solid that can support the throne that you, you mentioned. So if they translate it as expanse in Genesis, when they get to Ezekiel, they tend to translate it as platform or you know, something that can support. Uh, but um, the ones that start out with dome or vault carry it through, and the ones that start out with um, firmament carry it through. The ones that start out with expanse sometimes change. And I think that's significant because the problem we have here is a very general problem with the biblical translation. And it's, um, till I got involved in attempting to translate, I didn't realize how um, the things that you cannot, the things that you don't believe exist or that you cannot conceive of, you find great difficulty in seeing them in the text, even if that's the obvious meaning of the text. 
So what appears to have happened here, there certainly is a possibility of translating Rakia as expanse in the sense of a solid expanse, because when you beat, when you beat a brass um, ingot into, this was probably started actually as a, as a brass plate, mm -hmm. and uh, the beating was necessary in order to form the rim and to shrink the, the metal here. And if you look carefully, you can actually see the hammer marks all around the edge here and around the edge here. And uh, it's, it's quite remarkable in, that somehow they managed to get fluting out of the beading. That's a yeah, that, pretty this is, good artist. This is all done by hand. And the, they tell me that the artisans that did this, uh, with all the turmoil in the Middle East, have fled the scene. And that these are now getting to be quite valuable because the people that knew how to do it are, are disappearing. But it's clear in the Bible that, um, that the, the verb, raka, and the noun, rakia, referred often, whether they always referred to or not is, is up for discussion, they often referred to the beating out of gold or bronze or um, plates like the censers that um, strange fire were offered in. It says they were beaten into plates and used to cover the altar. The, the beating out of metal was a very common uh, event, and it was the only way in which metal could be shaped. Because they, they, could, they didn't have rolling mills, and they couldn't cast it in sheets and things like that. Well, they, they could actually uh, cast it, because that's the molten mirror that we talked about yeah. earlier. Um, but typically, uh, we think that they cast it in ingots and then beat the ingots out. And I brought along a, uh, a hammer here. Uh, this one is, um, is a metamorphic sedimentary rock that um, actually was um, designed as a, a hand axe. Uh, but their hammers would have looked very similar to this. If you can picture beating out a bowl with something like this on a rock base, because remember, they wouldn't have had an anvil, and they wouldn't have had a ball-peen hammer, which is what we would use to, to do something like this. So conceptually, for the Hebrews, this, this is the operation, and it would have been very familiar to them in all the marketplaces. This is the way that you made a container out of, uh, out of an ingot of... It would have been bronze rather than brass, probably. Now, the word, um, and I, I agree that the word uh, does come to mean spread out, but it means spread in the sense of, of a, solid a solid that's been increased in surface area. I think, and I can't prove this, I think that the translators who translated it as expanse understood that in all likelihood, people who read it as expanse would not picture a solid brass thing being expanded in area, but would leap immediately to something like atmospheric expanse. Now, I can't prove this because I'm quite sure that the people who did the translation originally understood that they were using expanse in an unusual sense, but they didn't limit it to, to expansion of metal, even though the dictionaries do. They just left it as expanse, and that's how we get to atmosphere uh, expanse or uh, things of that sort, because um, if, um, and I've, I've gone back and very rigorously checked this, when you get a Hebrew dictionary other than the one that we quoted, uh, which obviously doesn't support it, and they use the word expanse, it's always a solid that has been expanded in area. So I think that that's how we got to expanse. Now, it's taken on a life of its own since then. And that is why we object to it. <laughs> because the term expanse is almost inevitably, notice the fudge there with the word almost, it's almost inevitably misleading. To, when, somebody say, when somebody reads, God made an expanse, that sounds like empty space, which is clearly not what the, the author and hearers originally understood uh, by the language. And uh, since our effort, uh, imperfect though it obviously is, uh, our effort was to help modern readers get back and try to not only hear but feel, sense the meaning of the uh, original revelation of creation. Uh, we're uh, if I say offended, that's a little too personal and narcissistic, but 
we, we really object to the notion of expanse or the word expanse because it seems not to accurately convey what was originally intended. And we would say again, uh, though, uh, I, and I'm not sure if we could even find this out because translators don't often uh, reveal their inmost thoughts, but it is kind of interesting that the New International Version, which is probably in the evangelical world uh, and in popular Protestantism generally, the most widely used translation, it is kind of interesting that in the year, last year, 2011, the language was changed from expanse to, what is it now, vault? vault. It's, it's vault. Uh, by the way, let us confess that we have not found the right uh, single English word because uh, though we translated in, in the original hearer's version, we used vault, but some of our friends have complained that when they read vault, they, mean, they think bank vault, that doesn't work, or burial vault, that's even worse. Yeah, that doesn't work either. Uh, on the other hand, if we, and our other option was dome, uh, which is used in a number of translations, but that sounds like something you're looking at from the outside, not necessarily, but often we think of a dome as something over there that we can see, whereas clearly, clearly to us at least, um, the idea here is uh, looking up at a vaulted ceiling or a domed ceiling, but looking at it from underneath and from the inside, the way uh, the ancients and even we, we look up at the sky, uh, both day and night. And it has the general feel and atmosphere or, or impression, the sense is of, a, of looking up at a dome, but from the inside. Think, think Dome of St. Peter's from the inside. If some of you have a word that could describe that experience, we'd like to know it because we, we wrestled with this. As, as Fritz says, vault doesn't quite do it for many of us because we think of a burial vault or a bank vault. And, um, and dome doesn't do it either because we don't think of domes typically as looking up from the inside. But the dome of St. Peter's Cathedral viewed from the inside. Um, I think I'm going to let uh, our, uh, you have one at least there, you guys can share it. And let me read a quote first and then I make the question. Different meanings are expressed but the same word. There is no one word for each distinct idea. And my question is, when a word carry an idea with the context, it is possible that we take that word and try to up impose it somewhere else with the idea, the the carry with the original context? I, I think that uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at the linguistic range of the meaning of a word. And once we have a linguistic range, we look at a particular use of that word and say which part of the linguistic range seems to fit best in this context. There's, you have to be a little bit careful about that because it's easy for us to either use too much harmony because we don't believe that the ancients could have believed differently from us, but at the same time we have to be careful not to deliberately Make it clash with the uh, make it clash with the harmony that would otherwise be there. And the illustration I can give you that for that latter error is when 
the Lord God created instead of in the day that the Lord God created. That's clearly part of the linguistic range and to insist that it must mean in the day instead of when as it means elsewhere is to say I want my argument against the authenticity of scripture to take over from the, uh, from the possibility of meanings. You could translate it in the day. It's literally correct. But linguistically, it's not really fair because it doesn't fit the context. But you see, if you start out by saying, but what I want is something that will show that there's a clash of contexts, then you pick the one that won't fit because you're trying to show that the two uh, accounts don't fit each other. And this is the real problem that we run into. We like to say that theology doesn't influence any of this. But in fact, it does on both sides. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. One, uh, there is no uh, purely objective translation. Uh, inevitably, we, and translation always involves what is the most probable reading or the most probable meaning, and that's a subjective judgment, and everybody who works at translation uh, has to engage in this uh, for better and for worse. I just wanted to acknowledge that the quotation that the gentleman uh, read, I believe, is uh, from Ellen White, uh, and it's most readily found in the first chapter of Selected Messages, Volume 1, or Book 1, I guess it's, it's called. But a, a, very, uh, a very semantically sophisticated uh, recognition of the difficulty of translation, even the difficulty of communication. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to redirect our thoughts to Ezekiel, keeping in mind that Ezekiel is 1,000 years closer to us than the time of Moses, the time of the Exodus, and perhaps the time of Genesis 1, at least by conservative scholars. So um, there should be some insights there. But more than that, Ezekiel ties firmament in with tabernacle, temple, sanctuary, a definite sanctuary connection. And I, I really endorse John Walton for taking a brave stand of finding in Genesis 1 some temple language. Now, not everyone agrees with that, and I don't agree with the, all the direction that Walton runs with this. He runs way too far, in my opinion. But there is temple language. Uh, it's even in Genesis 2 and 3, and I have here the Andrews Study Bible, and the notes say that the garden was a miniature uh, temple or sanctuary. So once you do that, to carry the thread further, you have to go to the book of Revelation, and there you have the crystal. You know, crystal is kind of getting in our way, but it's a solid substance, and it's the redeemed that stand on the sea of glass like a crystal, and then in Revelation 21, 22, let's see if I can find, I just had my, yeah, Revelation 21, verse 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate was like one pearl, the street of the city was pure gold, it doesn't say the walls were gold, it says the streets, the foundation, what's below your feet, and so that ties in with uh, Ezekiel, it says pure gold like transparent glass. So maybe the compromise imagery would be solid, transparent, translucent, not just opaque, allowing the lights of heaven to come through. Anyway, that's the imagery I get for what it's worth. <laughs> well, and uh, I think the, the, uh, the whole... Um, what should we say, the journey or the saga of, of Rakia over, as you suggest, a thousand years of biblical authorship uh, 
reminds us of the, the precariousness of assuming that what the terms meant in Ezekiel, what the term meant in Ezekiel is what it meant in Genesis. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, to assume that it can't be the same is, is another uh, kind of assumption, which once again uh, illustrates the, uh, maybe we should just say the risk of translation, because you can't, if, if you're going to produce a translation that anybody is going to read uh, with enjoyment and satisfaction, you can't take account of all the possibilities and uh, sort of discuss them. Uh, you just have to go with something and, uh, and recognize that what you have decided on uh, may not uh, be precise. Uh, for example, uh, the, the in the day, and I think almost everyone agrees that the phrase in the day, though not everyone has, and there were some... Uh, well, and the King James didn't, you know. Back then they, they translated as in the day. And yes, and there have been people since who have struggled mightily to make sense out of that as a literal uh, statement. Yes, that and the is, days is a thousand years, and so uh, right. Adam lived 930 right. and he died, and therefore he died within the thousand years, and so he died within the day. And, and I, I've heard that kind of argument yeah. done. And you've heard also the argument, and you would know better than most of the rest of us about this, uh, that the, uh, in the day that uh, thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, that the thou shalt surely die should be translated, dying thou shalt die. Uh, uh, and they make it a good argument, except that it's usually affirming the fact that uh, right. the particular uh, thou shalt use, really die. You're or really going to die. Yeah, uh, but I'm just using that as an illustration right. of the, the fact that um, we, and a deliberate first person plural there, uh, we go to great lengths to try to make sense out of the text according to what we think the best sense is. And uh, we obviously don't all agree on that. Every, uh, every Hebrew word, as every English word, has a semantic map. And um, the translator's job is to look at that map and see where in, in the map coordinates the, uh, the most appropriate meaning in the translator's understanding of the text lies, and that's, the, that's where the translator will, will sit down and say, okay, I'm going to use this word because in its semantic map comes the idea that I think the Hebrew text is conveying, which is why every translation is a commentary. It's a commentary on the part of the translators as to the mental images that they get as they read the Hebrew and which they now translate back into English for those of us that don't read Hebrew. And this is why, in the best of all worlds, students would begin to learn Hebrew in the fifth grade, so that by the time they got to high school, they could do their devotional reading from the Old Testament, from the, from the Hebrew text. Now, that, the, the question is then, is the, is the Jewish uh, a school the best of all worlds? Well, I don't know. Uh, probably not by my judgment, but my judgment is, of course, finite and fallible. Yes. But I, the point I'm making is there really is no su adequate substitute for the original language. And, no. and those of us who have trouble with the, notice the plural first person there, those of us who have trouble uh, with the original languages are at a disadvantage, and it would be nice, though probably unrealistic, to hope that uh, at some time in the near future, uh, Adventists in general would just, uh, yeah. you know, read. Well, that is, of course, why um, when I was taking uh, uh, graduate school here at Loma Linda, um, one of the things they had me do was to take two quarters of uh, Hebrew from Kenneth Vine and when I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago, the first class I took was a quarter of Hebrew from uh, 
uh, Dennis Pardee. So, yes, those. I, I think it's really important to get back to the original languages whenever possible. Because to be perfectly fair, all of these commentaries are simply how somebody else understood it. And while I respect them, and I think you have to take them into account, they could be wrong. Just as we could be wrong. Right. Okay. Uh, I think that those who do not read Hebrew can feel lucky <laughs> because we have some people who do. And you, all three of you, evidently can do that. Now, you, you referred to, you use the word harmony. How do we achieve harmony? Today, I got up at 5 o'clock because I wanted to listen to Ted Wilson. And then at 7.30, I listened to the second service where he preached. He preached far away in Argentina. The special event was the inauguration of, as he described, one of the largest Adventist temples in the world. 26 capacity, 2,600 people. I don't know what the capacity is here, but he felt it was one of the largest university, Universidad Adventista del Plata. Now, what caught my attention is that he repeated what he said at the general conference. He referred to Genesis 1 as literal, consecutive, what is the other word? Contiguous. Con Contiguous. Contiguous. 24 hours days. day. Making now, week, such as we now, now, I think we have to be careful. We're not totally sure that the first three days were solar. Right. They were <laughs> earth rotational, but not necessarily <laughs> solar. Okay. But he, he stressed the word unity. He talked a lot about the unity of Adventists. Now, oh, he wants to build this unity his way. And he said, I am happy that here in South America, people are with me on this literal interpretation of Genesis. By this, he meant that elsewhere in the world, this unity does not exist. He wants to build this unity around his interpretation. So what do we do? How do we build this unity? <laughs> That's my question. Well, I think that the very first thing we have to do to start is to actually talk to each other. And it's helpful to do this, I think, in forums where the questions can be asked and answered and where we can agree on, uh, on at least where we agree on and then disagree on where we can disagree on and work with that. I, I think it's a mistake for us to have two or three or seven little camps that talk to themselves and nobody else. Unity is a matter of trust, not agreement. We can disagree and still trust each other, trust each other's intelligence and integrity. That's what real unity is about. Uh, the uh, No religious movement that I know uh, is characterized by uniformity. Uh, and Adventism has never been uniform in that everybody agreed. Read if you have a, some time, uh, read early uh, issues of the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. Boy, did they disagree. Uh, but they stuck together. And I think that's a possibility for us. Uh, if, if we will keep, keep talking with the understanding that if I want you to listen to me, I need to be willing to listen to you. If I think I have something that from which you could benefit, 
then I had better recognize that you may well have something from which I can benefit. Thus we keep talking, thus we keep learning. Yes. Um, back to Ezekiel, about crystal. We today use the word, well, yes, that's crystal clear. I don't refer to it as meaning solid, just something that's crystal clear. That will transmit light. And will transmit light. I also haven't heard it mentioned, maybe I just missed it, that the Bible refers to three heavens. Paul said he was taken up to the third heaven, to the heaven where God is, paradise. And then the first heaven is the atmospheric heavens, the air, as far out as it reaches from this planet. And then the second heaven is the starry heavens, beyond the atmospheric heavens. But they were visible in the air. And to the early Hebrews, they would not have known necessarily that there was a difference between heaven one and heaven two, the atmospheric and the starry heavens. Um, in, uh, uh, I don't want to make too much of it, but the word heaven is actually plural. It's Shemayim. Uh, maybe there was a thought back then that uh, kind of got lost and, and uh, has since been regained. Uh, it's, it's thin. I don't think I'd put too much weight on it, but it's, it's a possibility that there was a, uh, a thought that heaven was actually not a complete uniform substance all the way through. This is great. It's Uranus. Uh, well, Uranus contains heaven and also the god of heaven is Uranus. So the, the Greek Talk about getting difficulties with translation. As soon as you say Uranus, you not only bring in whatever the Greeks thought of as heaven, but you also, uh, which by the way, contains crystal spheres. I, we, we've talked about um, the atmosphere here as if the ancients uh, who first heard the, the story of Genesis 1 would have understood what we understand by atmosphere. That's exceedingly unlikely. Uh, we know what the atmosphere is because we understand gravity and the fact that gases are held on the surface of our planet. And that we've gone, now gone beyond the and atmosphere we've now gone beyond and we know it. what's out there. And we know that when we get beyond it, we enter the blackness of space. They would never have been able to conceive of anything like that. They knew they breathed air. They had no idea that it didn't go on to wherever the, um, the dome was. And there since seems they to be some question about the balancing of the clouds. And you know, how does air, which doesn't support anything, support the, support clouds. the clouds? And I, that our problem, is, our problem is a big one. And we often uh, minimize it. And that is that when we bring a description from the, the, the Hebrew world into our world, of something that happens in the realm of nature, like atmosphere, we have nowhere else to put it in our minds but into the category of science. They didn't have science. It hadn't yet separated itself from theology. What they didn't understand, God did. And it was only in the 1600s when natural philosophers, and they were called natural philosophers, because they began to philosophize about nature, started to separate out science as we understand it. Um, which the, is why they're still called PhDs. Which is <laughs> why they're still called PhDs. It goes all the way back to that. In First Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, I believe, it says the spirit of Christ, which was in the prophets, inspired the scriptures but that the prophets didn't understand what they'd written sometimes because they were not culturally determined. They did not write what they wrote because of what the culture around them told them to write. They wrote what they wrote because God revealed to them through the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, one God, three God, three persons in one God. God told them what to, to write. It is the Word of God, and therefore, going back to Genesis, we have to say that Moses might not have understood Genesis 1 the way we understand it from our scientific 
viewpoint, viewpoint, but God had him write it with enough, enough, a word that has enough flexibility in it, rakia and raka, uh, that our modern view does fit into Genesis 1 without us having to reject that Genesis 1 is describing our modern view as well as accommodating maybe their misinterpretation. However, in um, Job 38, and we understand Job to be the first book written, correct, by Moses, as was the first five books of the Bible, as were. Um, going back to that, uh, can you join God in spreading out the skies hard as a mirror of cast bronze? And we think, oh, well, this is another verse that's saying the sky was a dome. Uh, that was Elihu speaking, so perhaps he had that view. However, um, verse 30, uh, chapter 38, the next right following couple of verses down, the Lord speaks, then the Lord answered Job out of the storm, and he said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Um, God sort of was disagreeing with the view of, or what I thought at first was the view of Elihu that God was putting down, but actually uh, that wasn't really what Elihu was saying. Deuteronomy, also by Moses, says in uh, Deuteronomy 28, verse 23, excuse me, 22, uh, the Lord will strike you with scorching heat and drought, which the archaeology Bible says is the meaning of uh, in the study note says is the meaning of hard as a uh, uh, hard as a mirror of cast bronze. Um, the sky over your head will be bronze. The sky over your head will be bronze. And the the earth ground under your feet will be iron. The ground beneath you iron, and uh, with scorch meaning, he's going to strike you with heat and drought, according to the archaeology Bible. It, it's like um, when my mother and I were walking in Kansas one night, she looked at the sky, she said, this is tornado weather. And I said, why? She said, see how, she said, see the sky, it's as green as bronze. You rarely see a green sky. And this also, I think, is a, a reference to the scorching heat and drought, which was going to be a, a punishment. Uh, the sky over your head will be bronze. Will be bronze. The ground beneath you iron. He's speaking metaphorically here, and I think he is also in Genesis 1, although they may not have understood it that way. But by, um, by the time we have read through our Bibles to the book of Job, which actually was written first, uh, we understand that speaking of the skies that God spread out as hard as a mirror of cast bronze is actually used in Deuteronomy in a metaphorical sense. The skies will become bronze. I won't let the rain come down. Like our prayers go up to a bronze ceiling, we don't think there's literal bronze there. We just know that sometimes you feel like your prayers isn't going above your head much. That text actually is a kind of an interesting one because it appears that the sky isn't always bronze. And in fact, um, I think you could argue that the sky is usually crystal in their perception. You could argue that the sky is normally clear, but that implies that the bronze isn't always there, at least in that particular uh, section of Deuteronomy. I would like to boast that I got an A in third year Greek because I picked up a small lexicon, I think it was Blackwell's, Little and Scott. The lexicon dealt with roots and my third year Greek professor was a nut for roots. So I had him. <laughs> but if you look in any lexicon, you start with a root and then you have variations and then you have texts with different interpretations of that. Take the little word in. You can have pages of description of a preposition, what the little word en means. 
So when I look at scripture, I have to keep an open mind and not fasten on any particular proof text or, or evidence because it can mean a vari various things. So my problem with this brass dome is just that. It's a brass dome, and it can be many other things. I wouldn't focus on it. Well, I think that's the point of the argument I made, and I think that it's been conceded that it's not definitive, although, although I think that it's fair to say that it is reasonable to argue that way. I, at this point, what it comes down to is, do you see this as a coherent uh, tale that makes sense uh, for today, or do you want to see this as something that made sense for the Hebrews, but they were just ignorant people and we know better now? Well, uh, I hope nothing that we have, s that any of us have said here implies that the ancient Hebrews weren't as bright as we are. I, I, I am worried about the word ignorant because it often implies a dullness of mind. Or stupid. Yeah. Which stupid. is different from uh, uh, ignorant. From, from ignorant. Yes, it is, but it doesn't always, that difference doesn't always come through. Uh, it's my conviction that the ancient Hebrews were at least as bright as we are, but they didn't have all of the information that is available to us because there were not the means for uh, recording and storing up and accumulating uh, information uh, that we have. If, if your only means of recording is clay tablets, uh, the amount of information available is going to be uh, quite limited. Uh, so uh, we want to be sure that when we talk about uh, the writers of scripture, however, whenever we date them, uh, we are not suggesting that either they or their readers or hearers uh, weren't as smart as we are. They quite clearly did not have all of the categories with which we think are business about the birds and the winged creatures is a nice illustration of that. Uh, but uh, we should never denigrate their intelligence and especially not uh, their spiritual sensitivity, which is uh, why we now have scripture. Because not only did God speak to them, but they heard. And communication always takes both of those poles. They didn't understand dark matter. <laughs> not, not only did they hear, but every 15 years or so, they recopied these scriptures because if they didn't, they would have been lost long since. And you have to invest an enormous amount of time and energy in copying scripture. So whatever they understood, they understood it to be sufficiently valuable that they were willing to invest a, a significant portion of the community's resource you ever tried to write Deuteronomy out longhand? <laughs> you got a question there. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that we're not going to look at our, uh, how should I say, predecessors, uh, recent or ancient, as being um, dimmer than we are. Um, I, I'm greatly relieved to hear that because that was going to be my first and major criticism. Um, I recall uh, from grade one in our little readers pictures of a ship uh, just beyond the horizon and you first see the, the tips of the mast with the flag and then as you move as the ship moves closer then you see the sails and then you see the ship and that was the, the clearest evidence to a first grader that the earth is round. It didn't require great calculations or astronomical, uh, how should I say, uh, prowess. And I'm sure it's not high tech. 
And I'm sure that people, for as long as people lived on this planet, were seafaring people. And they would have made that observation. It was a simple observation to make. Any yokel could do it. Therefore, to begin to argue from the premise that the earth was somehow deemed to be flat would really be seen by anybody at any time in the past as being a very strange idea. Not any more common than it is today, except in the sense of ridicule. Now, the other point that strikes me as being rather mm, disturbing is that I've noticed this several times when I listen to, English, to people who started out with English as their mother tongue. And they're arguing at great length about the meaning of some English word in the Bible. And it strikes me, my goodness, they must believe that King James was given at Mount Sinai. <laughs> you know? <laughs> now, English is my third language. Now, what you're talking about, firmament in English, in, in Yugoslavian is svod, which roughly translated means just beneath water or with water. So when we're talking about swad and water above swad and water below swad, that means water above with water and water below with water. No, no, everybody's greatly illuminated by this, isn't it? <laughs> well, what you basically get the impression of is there is something there, but it is something that we don't really have a word for, and therefore it's something that's beneath the water that's above it and above the water that's below it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a strange thing. The same kind of funny experience I get when I hear people arguing about the word atone, atonement. In Yugoslavian, it just means it, to make peace. It, it, like, like when mom told us, all right, all right, you guys make up. You know, my brother and I frequently got into fights. And mom would say, all right, make oh, up, come on, say, say you're sorry. <laughs> and, and we made up. I mean, and the word that's used in the Bible in Yugoslavian is to make up. Well, meaning make up in that sense, to, to, to kind of reconcile. It's not some kind of, I don't know, doing penance or what, what some people conjure up. That, that, that's something important in English that never existed in any other language, to my knowledge. Uh, so what troubles me about this kind of study is what I've encountered in, in areas of science with certain groups of scientists known as cladists who will argue at great length over certain eh, categorizations about something they don't really understand. As if the birds they're trying to categorize give a hoot about which category they're put into. You know, the, the birds are quite happy where they are, the way they are, whether or not we call them in this category or that category. It's we who have a problem with the category. Now, the other problem that I have with language as such is that we often assume that grammar somehow determines the meaning. It's very often the other way around. As was described, or uh, how should I say, observed by the actual documentation of a new language in the process of being born in Nicaragua, the, uh, the, the sign language that was being in, <laughs> how should I say, created 
by deaf-mute children in Nicaragua. And the linguists came to study this language that is being born. And they've concluded that this language is emerging with syntax and grammar. And nobody told the kids to use grammar. They, nobody explained to the kids what syntax is. They had no idea about that. That was implicit. All they desired to do is to communicate with each other. So you see, sometimes, and this is where, you know, being 50% analytical and 50% intuitive, it helps me to see things from two sides of the coin. There is a trap into which pure analysis can fall into. And that is assuming that it can determine the truth. It cannot. Pure analysis is helpful as a tool, but not as the object. It was never meant to be. In this case, the object is communication. And we have to wish to appreciate what was communicated and how best to make sense of it, not what we can prove with it. Because if we start out with wanting to prove this or that, then we, well, I can, I can prove to anybody's satisfaction almost anything. That is why I distrust such approaches. I distrust pure intuition and I distrust pure analysis. Those two have to confirm with one another. They can never stand on one foot alone. You cannot be sure of where you'll end up. You can go off on a tangent and wind up who knows where. So we have two very bright, very capable, gifted, analytical minds who have given themselves a task of figuring out what people, mm, shall we say, 4,000 plus years ago, thought about the matter. And it troubles me. Why does it trouble me? Because I'm thinking to myself, all right, let's say that I really knew the answer to this question. How will that help me today? What was the original objective? Thank you. Um, I think we're going to have to let that be the last question, and I'll let you uh, well, I, I was just going to make a, um, a uh, brief observation uh, for Danilo. He, he referred on several occasions to what a word meant in Yugoslavian. And I would suggest that what Danilo actually means is that at some point in the past, somebody who spoke both Yugoslavian and understood Hebrew decided that that is what the word was going to mean. It was presumably well within the semantic map of the word. But a word doesn't mean anything from the Bible in Yugoslavian. It means what the translator decided was the best of the choices available. I, I think we're through now. Um, yeah, I, my, my comment... People are getting tired of sitting in these hard <laughs> seats. <laughs> my, my only comment is that, uh, that I agree we have to be very careful. We have to see how the words are used. And sometimes the words being used are underdetermined. I would love to get back to the original people who first read Genesis and say, how do you understand it? I would love to get back inside of Moses' head and say, uh, what did you mean when you wrote this? We can't do that. So what we wind up doing is these kinds of games which are actually trying to see through a, a glass darkly, if I can use the biblical phrase. And uh, I, I think it's important for us to be willing to see um, uh, what God has for us to see because 
with us trying to peer through this glass, if we're, if we're trying to put our own ideas into it, it's just far too easy to do for anybody. It's easy to take off on a tangent. Yeah. Can we, by searching, find out God?